It's indeed great to see you all, and uh, the more laps to be filled, the better it is. We need everyone to fight for conservation. So welcome to you all, and it's my great pleasure as president, as a proud president of this wonderful organization, to introduce these remarkable individuals here on stage. Um, welcome to the celebration of a 110-year anniversary of Fauna and Flora International. Thank you so much for your interest, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. And indeed, it is a celebration of 110 years of many achievements. And I would like to read out to you um, a message of support from the patron of this organization, Her Majesty the Queen. As, our pa as your patron, it gives me great pleasure to congratulate Fauna and Flora International on its 110 anniversary. You've been instrumental in helping to tackle the many threats that have and still do face our world today. I offer my warmest good wishes to you all on this special anniversary. And it's wonderful to have an engaged patron such as her with the organization. Now the many achievements over the last 110 years has been obviously centered around restoring and saving biodiversity in all corners of the world, from Indonesia to the Philippines, from Kenya to Sierra Leone, from Belize to um, Brazil, from Romania and Turkey, and every single spot in between. Our dedicated and specialized team of experts, sometimes working in very difficult circumstances, they have so many different roles to play. They have to eradicate um, uh, invasive species sometimes, sometimes they release animals, they advise, they assess, and they do everything in between. What they do is they learn from our successes, and what's more, they learn from our failures, and that is important too. And most of all, we learn and we work with local partners wherever we work. And as we celebrate the past, we're also realistic about the present and we look forward to the future. Two things that are very dear to my heart and to the organization. One is we have to maintain the urgency to tackle the pressures on the planet Earth that are growing as we speak. They're getting greater, they're getting more complex. Look at, for example, the scale of risks involved in climate change. And the other thing is to the need, and I'm very happy to see so many young people, and I feel a little bit ridiculous saying when I'm 47, young people. But I have so many young people, and we need to continue to engage young people in conservation. And tonight we saw at the AGM of FFI, we saw some wonderful work done, for example, at a turtle project in Nicaragua, and it showed again that education and engaging young people is important. And the other day, a 10-year-old said to me, children learn so that later on there are people and grown-ups who do understand how to, to treat the planet. And I think we can learn from this 10-year-old who happened to name, be named Rembrandt. Um, <laughs> nothing to do with the fact that I'm Dutch, which I'm sure you know by now. So FFI is a much, as much about nature as it is about people. And over the course of our history, we've always benefited from the support of and cooperation with so many outstanding, sometimes influential, and sometimes simply incredibly committed individuals from all walks of life, from science, from politics, from business, and from the media. Everyone is needed because we have so many roles to play. And all, therefore, are regarded as equal. Now, the word equality, of course, reminds you of this great novel by George Orwell, Animal Farm, and you remember that all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. I had to find a way to go and to my right. <laughs> and there are some individuals who simply are in a category of their own. Now, on my right, of course, is one of such species called <laughs> Sir David Attenborough. Now, 
Now, who am I as a Dutch lady standing here introducing Sir David? But I will say a few words to you. And um, I hope that afterwards you don't give me a smack on the hand to say that I've gone overboard. But you may. <laughs> Sir David is a much valued and wonderful and deeply, deeply committed um, member of FFI for 60 years. And through your eyes and through your voice, millions of people around the world have discovered remote places, making us feel humble, truly humble, and enjoy the planet's greatness. Microscopic details, secrets of the land, and magnitude of nature. And I'd like to thank you from all of us in FFI in all of these remote places and places that you know of that we may still not know of. We'd like to offer you our deepest respect and gratitude for all you've done for the organization and for the planet. Thank you. So to conclude on you, before the other hands get slapped, you inspire many regardless their age, regardless their backgrounds, and regardless their geographic location. Now talking about voices, I'd also like to um, introduce um, another renowned broadcaster, and um, I think the power of the voice is really something that is um, underestimated, uh, certainly in, uh, in our country, but hopefully not here. Um, uh, Libby uh, Purves, um, as you probably know, she's a Times um, a newspaper columnist, she's an author, she's a broadcaster, a drama critic, and of course the presenter of the BBC Radio 4 midweek programme, and I'm sure many other things that could not fit on my little mind map. So, without further ado, we are all ears, 700 of us, young, mid-level, age and older people. <laughs> so all the wisdom in the world, all the wisdom in uh, FFI to celebrate our 110 year anniversary and we're all ears as you discuss some of the issues facing conservation yesterday, today and hopefully tomorrow. Thank you very much. Well, good evening. Um, this is a great treat, um, and I'm really impressed that you have been a supporter of FFI for over half its 110 years. Mm. That's a good record. Um, I want to start a bit, though, with your own life and, and how it all began. You once said, no, I don't love animals, I'm just amazed by them. Um, that's a, it's a particular kind of focus I think you've given us, which is unsentimental, but not quite coldly scientific. Is that a reasonable definition of how you feel? Yes, I think so. Um, I don't preclude loving animals. Uh, I mean, I, as a boy, I love my dog, I'm sure of that. Um, but, one, but I don't love earthworms, and I'm not, <laughs> and I'm, I'm not potty about locusts. <laughs> but, but I am in deeply, um, engaged and involved and obsessed by the natural world, the variety of it and the intricacy of it and the way it works. And that's what I think um, nature, people who like nature are. You don't love it all in that kind of sentimental way. It doesn't preclude you from loving bits of it. But at least I don't at any rate love it all. I love a lot of it, but I'm fascinated by all of it. But it is, it's a useful focus, isn't it? Because if you just become obsessed, as some of us do with sort of fluffy, wuffy baby polar bears and so on, then the whole infrastructure of really quite ugly, slimy things which supports the polar bears gets ignored. I mean, there's a big problem, isn't there, people only wanting cuddly pandas. Quite so. Not ugly newts. Quite so. And, and actually, if you, you put yourself through a terrible emotional mangle if you actually love every part of the natural world, because every spring you're going to see all kinds of things. I mean, last, we had mallards 
reading in our garden, and I was thrilled to the marrow I was last spring. Um, but I knew in my heart of hearts that the foxes would be there. This is in London, I may say. It's, it's not any, <laughs> but, but the foxes would be there, and they were going to have those little divine, wonderful little balls of fluff, the little mallard chicks. And of course, in due, sort, in due course, they did. Uh, and um, I was sorry, of course. But I think I understand enough about the natural world to know that that's inevitable. How did it all begin for you? you? You've talked about collecting fossils when you were a child. That's an unusual way in, in a sense. Yes, I, I um, you know, collecting is a, you can, it, it, it's a bit of a disease. I'm, I'm afflicted with disease. I, 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 do, <laughs> I do collect things. But, you know, collecting shouldn't be dismissed. Connecting when you're a kid is, is one of the crucial trainings for a naturalist. I mean, Darwin was obsessed with beetles, so was Wallace, come to that, and all the great naturalists. Uh, the basis of, of taxonomy, the basis of classification, if you start collecting things, it doesn't matter whether it's motor cars or uh, labels or indeed uh, stamps or, 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 or fossils. Fossils are better than the previous two, I should add. <laughs> but, but what you do is you discover what is a species, and what is a subspecies, and what are the relationships to them. And you form your own little taxonomy, and you learn how to allocate the natural world as you see it and understand it. And that's a crucial basis. Um, so I certainly collected, collected fossils. Leicester, where I grew up, is on the, on the Jurassic, on the upper Lias, middle Lias. The Jurassic, and, and full of wonderful stuff, absolutely marvellous, ammonites and bellamites, but also things like terebratulas, you know, and rinconellas. I can, I mean, right now I know the names of most of those, scientific names, of Latin names of most of those fossils. And I remember when I was about 14, I was cycling on my bicycle, no, maybe 12, cycling on my bicycle through eastern Leicestershire, and I came across a hill with a, with a signpost, and, I, and it said, Tilton, three and a half miles. And I thought, Tilton? That's where T Tiltonoceros actually was found. This must be a magical place, you know. And there it was. And yeah. was it? Did you get there? Were you allowed to roam Tilton around on your bike? I got Tiltonoceros, yes. You were, allowed, you were allowed to roam as a child, were oh, you? Oh, those days. Well, they were, they were, they were disused ironstone quarries, so you, nobody minded you going around getting them. So you took, in the end, a natural sciences degree, and then I think a national service. And then television was just about getting revved up, really, wasn't yes. it? Had you intended... I, I've heard you originally tried to get into radio. And yes, I, I had never seen television, actually. Um, I, I, I was working in publishing, which was pretty boring. I don't mind telling you. It's on my level, at any rate. Well, I mean, my job was, was putting in commas, or on a good day, taking out commas, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, in, uh, on, on books about tadpoles, you know. <laughs> And, uh, and that gets, you know, for a week. Tadpoles right? virtually are commas, aren't they? So you, <laughs> yeah. you, could, you could get a bit weird that right way. <laughs> and I, I was very bored by that. Um, and I just saw this advertisement in the Times saying, you know, BBC Radio wanted a talks producer. I thought, anybody could do talks producing. I still think they can, actually. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I thought I could do that. And I applied and didn't get a... Didn't get a, I got a reply, courtesy demanded that, but I didn't get an interview. And then about a fortnight after that, I got a letter from someone in, on a BBC uh, letter which said, um, we have got it, we have seen your uh, advert, uh, application and we know you didn't get the job, but we also have a new thing which is called television, which <laughs> some people are rude about, but we think you might be interested. Would you care to apply? So I went up to Alexander Palace, which was the only place in Western Europe where they had television, believe it or not, in 1952, um, and um, met people there. I, I thought it was terrific. There were just two, two studios, neither of which was as big as this auditorium. I mean, about a quarter the size of this auditorium. And all the television service, in, uh, all television in, in Britain came from those two studios. And it was all live, and it was all terrible, but it was wonderful. true that some... some <laughs> Is it true that somebody told you you shouldn't be on screen because you had the wrong shaped teeth or something? Yes, well that is true. Um, I mean, <laughs> both parts of it. And, um, I mean, I was, while I was there, I, I, I was uh, applied. They said they'd take me on as a trainee. 
And we all, we all ate in the same canteen, and we all just produced programmes, you know, do anything. People would come in, and someone came in one day and said, I'm looking for a chap <laughs> to interview um, an athlete. Will you come along? I said, sure, why not? Staff, no fee, you'll recognise. SNF, yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and, um, and I interviewed this, this chap. Um, and I don't think it was very good, really. In fact, I know it was terrible. Uh, but, but anyway, at the end of it, um, I was not asked again to be as an interviewer. <laughs> and eventually, in my career in the BBC, I ended up, and you'll be familiar with the process, you eventually end up in a position where, where, where you have to give gifts to people when they retire. And it turned out that the man who, who produced that initial thing in 1952 was retiring. And so what happens in the BBC then, I don't know now, but they, the personal file, which is kept in registry, was sent to the chap you had to make a speech, which was me, and you leaf through to find if you could see something juicy to put in, uh, spice up your letter of your speech of thanks. And I, and I went through, and there it was. There was a letter from the head of the talks department which said, Attenborough uh, is an intelligent enough man, boy, um, but he should not be used as an interviewer again. His teeth are too big. <laughs> <sighs> you think, to think of all the animals with enormous, terrifying teeth, which have, since then you have made stars, you see. You did, of course, ca carry on in broadcasting. In fact, you became a channel controller. You, you very, I mean, you could have been the great silverback gorilla leader of the BBC, the great director general we never had. Um, but uh, instead, to all our oh, great profit, you, you carried on with this experience of bringing the natural world to the screen. When you start to conceive a series and discuss a series with the BBC and with your colleagues and with cameramen, we must never forget the extraordinarily heroic patience and brilliance of your cameramen. Um, whether it's a frozen planet or life on Earth or the life of plants, um, whatever, do you sort of have to create a storyboard in your head? Do you have to have a, a big overarching theme which you're pretty sure about before you begin? Uh, well, I think so. Um, I mean, it doesn't necessarily follow that everybody does, but and there are programmes that you can make which don't have storyboards, which paint a picture blurry, hazy, but nonetheless beautiful picture, and I'm not knocking that. But for me, a story, a narrative, is an absolutely crucial element in, in a... We're almost back to taxonomy. You want to know how things fit together. You I do. think the thing which I've always valued as a non-naturalist about your programmes is that stuff fits together. Oh, yes, that, because that, because that. And that's right. And the way they fit together, that they do, is actually a story, because they evolve that way. And when I resigned from uh, the staff, and I had the, I, want, I immediately put up an idea which I'd cherished for a long time, which was that we should tell the greatest story in the world, which is how from a, a mole complex molecule in the bottom of the sea we ended up here, um, and and that is a, a fascinating, riveting, exciting, and thrilling story. And every episode, uh, and uh, fortunately, <laughs> I don't know, um, the story of the creation actually falls into 13 parts, which is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which is the quarter in which BBC television planners plan their schedules. Now, it's an, a neat coincidence. I don't know who thought of it first, but anyway. It's so extraordinary that, it did. that they should be 50 minutes long as uh, well. I mean, it's a natural as, wonder, as, isn't it? As well, as well. <laughs> And we ended each one by saying, so, fish managed to get onto land, but having got onto land, how could they possibly move about since they didn't have legs? And how could they be there? Tune in next week. And, <laughs> and, 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 and that continuous story of evolution is, of course, the most thrilling, complex story there is. And it's what keeps evolutionary biologists going to their labs every day and watching animals every day. It's a thrilling, thrilling story made for television, in my view. But when you're, you're planning something like the, the, the Arctic, um, uh, Antarctic programmes, of course, in you know, a life at the poles and so on, you can't ever be quite sure what footage you're going to get, can you? Because I mean, we have seen, but uh, Doug Allen, these ferocious Arctic battles of seals and whales and penguins all duffing each other up and uh, plotting against each other and throwing each other off birds. You can't be certain. 
you're going to catch those behaviours. I mean, you could just tell us scientists have observed these behaviours, but we want to see them. Believe you me, you can be, I can be pretty sure an elephant seal is going to do what it's going to do. I mean, there are quite a lot of things which are predictable. But, what, but that's the beauty of the natural world. It's enormously various. And if you get things which you can't, which you fail to film, you can find usually something that will take their place. But having said that, there are very, very few things that if you give yourself, well, the 13 part series is going to take two and a half, three years to make. That's not very long, actually. It's taking three months to make a, a 50 minute film is not bad. And three years and four, that's 12 parts. So you're doing quite well. But if you've got three years, you can really plan what you want to do. And you can make the important things uh, crucial, and then you can leave spaces where you can say, well, if we get it, it'll be good luck, and if we won't. And you'll take gambles every now and again, decide something, put a bit of money into it and see what it works. But by and large, you can get what you want. Are there ever moments, have there been moments, where your cameramen have observed and filmed certain behaviours which scientists hadn't actually really known about yet? Not many. Not many, um, and we in, in the Natural History Unit are very, very dependent upon scientists. Um, and uh, I mean, I, when I started, I used to think that you were going to go to a scientist who had spent 10 years, 15 years, sitting there in some uh, appalling, <laughs> cramped position, some in a ghastly rainforest, pouring with rain, in order to look at one simple little creature that does certain things. And long people come from, from television and say, will you tell me actually well, exactly what happens after the result of all this labor of yours, so because we want to make a three minute film. I wouldn't mind, I wouldn't be surprised if the scientist said, if you think I've done all this thing, for you just to come along and skim the cream, you've got it wrong. But that's never happened, not once. If you go to the scientist and he believes, or she believes, that you are being honest about them, what, what they're working about, and that you'll furthermore uh, give them all the, record, all the material you record for their use, they've always unreservedly been helpful. It's, it's, it's very happy and very rewarding. From time to time, we, we've had these sort of minor outcries about things being filled in a more planned way, like the polar bear cubs were actually in a zoo. I mean, whether anyone really thought your cameraman was going to crawl into a cramped ice cave with a mother polar bear and her babies, I do not know. But there are times and ways sometimes that in order to get the, to get the story and, and to get the behaviours, you have to do that, don't you? It's, it must be a hard problem for you knowing at what stage you signal that in commentary or not? Yes, um, but you said just now that, that, that narrative is very important. Um, and if you're spending time trying to explain what the life of a polar bear, since you raised the issue, uh, what the life of a polar bear is like um, in, in those environments, and, that, and you're building up a story in which you atmosphere is very important, the narrative is what's going to happen. Now, one of the crucial things in the biology of a polar bear is that the female goes and makes a snow den in which she's going to spend the winter. And in the depths of winter, when she is comatose and half, half uh, in hibernation, because they don't totally hibernate, but half in hibernation, and she, a, a little tiny thing, no bigger than a drowned rat, emerges from her, and this is her baby. And the fact that she produces it in the middle of winter is a crucial element in the story of her biology. Now, we, so we had to film it, at least if we possibly could. And we knew, I mean, if you had tried to do it in the wild, either the polar bear would have killed the cameraman. Uh, a well, I said, it's, it's a possibility, actually. Uh, if, you, if you disturbed her in the middle of the winter, and you would certainly, if you did disturb her, you would probably also could kill the, 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 baby, the baby cub. So it's not on, you couldn't do it. But then you would discover that there's a zoo in Germany well, uh, that is going to happen, and you film it. Now, I suppose it could be possible after carefully building up the picture and the atmosphere, the cold and the one thing or another, that suddenly you say, and so she gives birth, and then you say, and by the way, this is being filmed in Frankfurt Zoo. <laughs> <laughs> is that sensible? Problematical, yeah. No. 
and, 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 and so, but you don't hide the fact. I mean, the reason that the press picked it up was that someone noticed that we said in the credits, all credit to Frankfurt Zoo at the end, see, which was fine, because we were perfectly uh, at home about that. And of course, your cameraman had caught the most extraordinary, wonderfully funny mating behaviour of the polar bears. Where, where yes. basically the she polar bear plays by the rules, very yes. hard to get. Yes. You know, completely exhaust the male following her around. And that, that was, behaves. that was, I was going to say it's luck, it wasn't, it was perseverance actually, it was Doug Allen. Yeah. 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 Of course, I mean, you, uh, again, it, it's, a, it's an interesting interface, because you know, you've got theatre in the family with your, your, your big brother Richard, and you've always had, as well as your scientific awareness, a strong sense of spectacle, of presenting all this as theatre. As you know, and th that's important, is it? You, you really could not have just been droning on all these years and showing us nice pictures. We wouldn't have stayed with you, would we? Well, I've, I mean, yes, it, it comes back to what you're saying about narrative, really. Um, I mean, I've always thought that, um, that narrative was crucial, um, and um, understanding comes with that and brings it, uh, brings it to life. We ought to mention, because it's Flora and Fauna International, we ought to mention the flora and the plants, because I think, in a curious way, one of the most riveting series was the life of plants. I mean, was that difficult to get past the commissioning editors at the BBC? You know, yeah, I want to look at a lot of plants. You're yeah, right. <laughs> He's over the top. Didn't really tell him. <laughs> what? Did you? Did you lie? Did you tell them there were going to be furry animals in We've it? We've got another wonderful sequel series. The budget will be another 10% extra, I'm afraid. You know, because it has to be, but it'll be all right. Um, but the, but the, <laughs> you really didn't admit that you were going to be doing, you know, the, the, how, the, how the Blackberry is taking over the world. And well, stuff. I, 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 I have remember to, that, I have I've to never say forgotten that, it. But in those days, the structure of the bee was rather different. And the BBC changed for, for reasons perfectly acceptable and understandable reason. But in those days, I was the head of the Natural History Unit. And I, speaking as an ex-controller, I mean, if the head of the Natural History Unit came up to me and said, uh, look, I've got a 13-part series, this by this bloke, he, the last series he did got very good figures, absolutely okay, and he's potty about doing something or other. What you said as a network controller, of course, if that's what he wants to do, let him do it. And happily, uh, they, that's, they did that to me. And that was in those, that was in the 70s, or 80s, rather. Yes. Yeah. I remember you explaining to me how, how wheat had basically tamed humankind. For anyone who's too young here to have, to have seen it, um, basically, we are all the playthings of wheat. Yes. <laughs> explain, explain this. This is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just, just that if you turn the glass the wrong way round, and you think, you think all of us think, we, that we manipulate wheat. But what wheat, actually, if you could think, uh, it would actually say, as a consequence of my changing genetically, I now rule the world, as it was 2,000 years ago, more than that, 4,000, 10,000 years ago. Um, I was just a little weed around the Tigris and the Euphrates, and that's all I was. But as a result of actually having seeds, which have rather extra amount of uh, nourishment in them, we've got this poor sucker, Homo sapiens, to spread me all over the world. I now <laughs> occupy a major part of North America. We, in fact, oddly enough, plants, uh, I got an um, ethical telling off just now um, outside because I was saying, of course, if biodiversity in plants are just so massively important because, you know, there could be something we haven't even found yet, you know, which is in some obscure habitat and yet which could cure all diseases. You don't approve of that point of view, do you? <laughs> I, well, what I said was... <laughs> <laughs> We are fauna and fauna uh, uh, international, and we protect all species. But if you say, well, the reason that we protect species is because they're of value to us, uh, I can see that's a very good practical reason for actually preserving the rainforest, because there's lots of plants there that may have uh, alkaloids or whatever in their, in their genome, which would be useful for medical. But I question that. Uh, I mean, that, I'm, I'm not against it as a reason, but it shouldn't be the fundamental reason, in my view. The fundamental reason is not because it should be affecting us, but because we have the stewardship of the world. We have the stewardship of this planet. 
we're the only creature that's ever existed in the history of the planet, as far as we know, that has dominion over everything and can exterminate everything. And if we start selecting things and saying, well, I'm going to keep this, but I'm not going to keep that, and you exterminate it, I maintain that is not a morally uh, proper proposition. Well, it can, it can also lead to extinctions, because, I mean, palm oil is very useful to people who grow it all over places like, yes. like Borneo, but it means the orangutans will have nowhere to live. They're, exactly. they're one of the endangered uh, exactly so. species at the moment. I mean, they? yes, absolutely. I mean, what, what value is the orangutan to us? Any? It's nice to look at, but yes, what have, what's the orangutan ever done for us? Is it? No, well, no, I mean, <laughs> sure, I mean, what, what good is the mountain gorilla to us? Well, actually, of course, it is good to the people of Rwanda because it, because it brings in a lot of money. But that's not the fundamental reason why FFI decided that it should actually be preserved and protected. It is because we are, have the stewardship of the world in our power as a species, and we ought to protect that world. We don't have the right to exterminate nature and manipulate it to that degree. At least, that is the moral proposition which I'm putting forward, and there will be plenty of people who argue with it, sure. But that's my position, anyway. It's very easy for us to sit around in a country like this where, you know, you, you really, you, you wouldn't want to sit down to dinner with anybody who wanted to shoot tigers or anybody who despoiled the environment and so on. But, it, it's not the same globally, is it? I mean, Prince Charles has recently pointed out that wildlife crime, especially ivory and rhino horn trades, which I thought must be fading away and becoming extinct, no. they're actually rising. Yes. Well, how is this happening? Why is this happening? Uh, because, I mean, in, a, in a, a, a very practical way, because people are more are wealthier than they were, and there are more of them than there were. Um, and uh, the animals themselves are scarcer than they were. Well, if that isn't a recipe for putting up the price, uh, of course, what is? And the uh, more the price goes up, uh, the more people will risk and, and, and cut corners and decide they don't care whether elephants survive or not. Yeah. We do get to a point where we start to ask ourselves whether mankind is too successful as a species. I mean, it leads on to population growth, it leads on to all sorts of philosophical questions. How, uh, how do you feel about that, philosophically speaking? I, I have little doubt that if we have the capacity to, uh, to limit our growth, our birth rate, um, that we should actually consider about doing that. There is a, a, sort of a, little, a little cliche, which is that we have a finite environment, the planet, and anyone who thinks that you will have infinite growth in a finite environment is either a madman or an economist. <laughs> of course, some, some say, I think somebody was accusing you the other day of being um, a bit too pessimistic about population growth because actually as living standards rise in large parts of the, of the world, people do have smaller families. There's no longer this sense that you better have eight children because some of them will die. Um, yes. you, are you, are you, can you be optimistic about it? Well, that is the one gleam of, of, of light, um, which is, as you've just said, wherever women are in charge of their own bodies, wherever they have the appropriate medical facilities, wherever they are literate, wherever they have political power, and wherever they have the medical uh, things available, birth rate falls. Um, and that, therefore, means that those of us in the, who are more developed countries who have all those things should make sure that those who haven't get in. And that is the one way in which I can see that, that in fact, population growth will really slow down in a serious way. And there's also a sense of... Uh... I mean, it's, uh, people talk about exporting democracy, but the exporting environmentalism is, is a tricky thing, and a tricky thing sort of politically and ethically. I remember being in the Seychelles when they were just starting up their ecotourism movement. I don't know how successful that's been since, but they were very keen at the time, and they had a beach cleaning patrols to make sure there was no plastic on the beach and so on. But of course, some, uh, I went, one of my local guides took me out and sort of chucked all the picnic things down. I said, no, we must take those home. And he said, no, because there's beach cleaners now. And we had a huge argument about turtles, because he said, we've always eaten turtles. 
You know, if God hadn't meant us to eat, eat turtles, he wouldn't have made turtles so tasty. Um, <laughs> and we're going to go on eating turtles, because there are turtles, and it would be quite wrong. And then she, she then went very Catholic on me and said, you know, God will provide more turtles. You know, and it's, it would be blasphemous of us not to eat turtles because that... And you sort of think, yes, there's a whole area of the world where you really got to gently sort of persuade people, haven't you, that it's worth looking after nature. Yes, yes, you certainly have. And I don't think that is as uphill as you would suggest. Um, I uh, was recently in, in, in East Africa um, where there was a turtle conservation uh, little um, unit which was getting in turtles that were brought in by fishermen, being accidentally caught, were actually rehabilitated and released. And the local fishermen were, were cooperating in all sorts of things. Um, and people who live close to the natural world, um, they don't have, it's true, they don't have uh, romantic ideas about it, but they know about its welfare and they care for its welfare. And if they're given the chance, they will certainly look after it. I mean, why are the people in Africa and Asia, all over the place, who really, local people, who give their lives for these things. I mean, the people looking after, uh, the, looking after guarding elephants and rhino in East Africa now, local African people, are giving their lives. I mean, it's not a, it's not a facile um, figure of speech. They it can actually be very are there dangerous. because they believe they should be protected. Do you think that flagship species are important for conservation. When you look at World Wildlife Fund, their logo is a panda. I mean, we all know pandas are terribly badly behaved and actually quite dull in their ways and refuse to mate, but everybody loves them. And so we use them. And I mean, there is this sort of sense that, that you know, some species, you, you hold them up and people will give money for them. I mean, is, is, that, is that a valid thing or is that an unhealthy thing? Yes, FFI, uh, of course, started with, with the, the Arabian Oryx. That's its emblem. And that you can wear its lapel. And I should have been wearing mine tonight. Um, and that's been very useful. And not only has it been useful, but it's been an example of what you can do if you really put your mind to it. The Arabian Oryx is safe now. And it wouldn't be if it was not for conservation movements such as FFI espouses. So that, that, that's fine. Um, and it's, it's a perfectly valid way of rattling a, cage, a, a, a collecting box in the, in the high street with a panda on it. That's okay. That's okay. But, but when people become involved in, the, in, in conservation, it, the conservation movement itself has a responsibility to educate those people, to show those people how, in fact, keynote species or in, in, you know, um, charismatic species like this are uh, only that. Actually, you see, it, it, supposing it was in the case that, that um, the Javan rhinoceros was so, so reduced in numbers that it would only live in zoos. Now, a Javan rhinoceros in a concrete-lined pit is not anymore a Javan rhinoceros. It's a prisoner for a start. It's not behaving properly. It, it's, it, it's a travesty of what a real rhinoceros is. The only way the Javan rhinoceros will survive is if the forests survive. And so the Javan rhinoceros movement to help that means you've got to protect the forest. And the Javan forest, rainforest, very much reduced, appallingly reduced. But nonetheless, that is very precious. And it's the insects and it's the plants and it's the birds, as well as the rhinoceros, which the whole constitutes the whole ecosystem. That's what you have to be saving. But of course, the big zoo argument is that if people could just see the magnificence of some of these creatures in a zoo, they would be more inclined to protect the idea of them in the habitat. I mean, that, that's always been the argument for zoos when people argue against that, them. That's Valley. perfectly true, but there are some things that shouldn't be in zoos. I mean, some things that you cannot provide the right sort of environment for the animal to remain sane. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, but zoos have changed hugely since I started, I accompanied a zoo a collecting expedition in 1954. Um, and, and, uh, but since then, I mean, in that time, 1954, we were at the end of the Victorian attitude to the natural world, which was absolutely correct and proper, which is we have to catalogue it. Until we know what is there, we can't really handle it. And so the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century was occupied in cataloguing. And zoos measured their success by, by swanking, by saying, how many species we've got here? 
And the fact that they were all, uh, they, to, to build up the numbers, they were all little sort of furry rodents, which were all nocturnal, never came out, and nobody ever saw them in the London Zoo, <laughs> which was the case. Um, that was neither here nor there, because they were, they were compiling the lists. Well, now we've got past that stage now, and zoos understand that. And, and zoos, in, informed, educated zoos now, are understanding that their message should be about conservation, which it certainly is. But at quite a lot of, of your career, you, you would say sometimes about conservation, I am just telling the story, I am just showing, you know, and others can see what's to be done. But lately, you've got a bit more toothy about controversial issues like fossil fuel burning and population and so on. Is this because things are getting more serious or is it just because you think you have built up such an awareness over a lifetime that it's, it's only right that Attenborough should sort of stir it up a bit? Uh, it isn't really. That, 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 that is not quite how it is. Quite, uh, quite how it is, I mean, you're a broadcaster and, and I'm a broadcaster and we both work for the BBC. And if you're going to go out on a limb and you're going to say something which is not proven, which is, not, which is controversial, you have to be very careful what you're doing. Because if you represent in some ways the voice of the BBC, because you and I have extraordinary access to this medium. Um, and if we uh, abuse it to grind axes, we are, I think, culpable. I'm not talking about axe grinding, I'm talking about messages no, which are pretty I, acceptedly I, 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 strong. I, I, but I, quite, I quite agree. Um, but the second part of what I was going to say was, therefore, if you've got a, a, a proposition that is suddenly becoming apparent because of things are changing, you'd better be sure you've got it right. And, a long t and the, after all, the whole process of science is that when you put a theory, you test it. You get the evidence to see whether it's right or not. And you don't say it's right until you're sure it's right. Uh, and that's what happened as far as conservation, or as far as, uh, as climate change is concerned, I would say. I, I remember very, very well um, the moment when it was in the, in the 80s, yes, in the 80s, I went to a lecture in, 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 uh, in France uh, where Professor Cicerone, who was a very, very distinguished president of the American Academy of Science and a climate scientist, he produced a series of graphs about the contents and the change of the atmosphere over the past 500 years. Com, um, plotted against uh, the Industrial Revolution and the increase of human population. And at the end of it, you simply could not deny that it had to be the case, A, that the world was changing uh, the, climatically, and B, that humanity was involved in bringing that change about. And then I said what I said. Just going back to animals, and going back into your memories of all these journeys and all these trips, are there any that you find yourself actually quite disliking. Disliking? Yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, I know you're fascinated by them all, but, you know, when I see no, a, an alligator or a crocodile, uh, I just, I, I, don't, I don't want it. I don't even want to look at it. Oh, I, don't mind, I don't mind a cockroach at all. You're all right with crocs? But I'm absolutely okay they with cockroaches. No, I don't mind them at all. On the other hand, <laughs> rats. I had a pet rat. They're all right. They're very intelligent. You can keep your pet rat. <laughs> I'm not, re I'm not referring to your pet rat. I'm referring to a rat with whom I only had a very brief acquaintance. I was sitting, I'm sorry about this, I was sitting having had a stomach upset on a lavatory in India. And a rat came up between my legs. <laughs> you like rats? Yes, but that... So that was one rat that you disliked. I'm wondering whether there's any type of animal are, you just find yourself slightly repelled by. You no, just... I'm slightly repelled by rats. <laughs> um, and I can, I, can, I can give you a sort of logical reason. Um, we, it's easy enough to love almost anything, providing actually you've got the sense of control. You know, uh, it, can, it can be out there and you can be in, in here and that's fine over there and you're okay here. The problem about rats uh, is that they are not respecters of that particular division. <laughs> and they have the capacity to be in your house, in your larder, as well as other parts of your house. Um, and you have no control of them and they carry disease. And under those circumstances, I think I'm justified to say I'm not keen on them. 
But if the BBC were to want you to make a programme about the extraordinary life cycle of the rat and I've done the, that. the way they've... Yes, you've done that, haven't you? Yeah, I've done that. Yeah, it's fascinating. And you're still... <laughs> Fancy preferring an alligator to a rat. It's a curious thing. What about, I mean, we must stop in, in a couple of minutes, but what next for you? I mean, you're, you're, you're not, you know, you, you've got plenty of years left, plainly. Um, what, what do you want to do? Is there a, is there a programme or a, an yes, area I'm, you want to yeah, explore? Yes, yes, yes. I'm, um, I'm going off to um, Borneo in the new year, uh, I hope. I'm making a series on the evolution of flight. Uh, starting with insects and going all the way through, and then uh, that's one program, ending up with, with hoverflies, which are one of the most mechanically ex astounding bits of the creation. Uh, and then moving on to vertebrates and going from the first birds, which of course the first birds were dinosaurs with feathers, and I've just been in China looking at those. Uh, and then moving on to true birds, and then from true birds, well, by way of pterosaurs, pterodactyls and so on and then uh, ending up with bats, see? All those fabulous gliding bats, I mean, those, those flying and, mammals. And, and well, we start with gliders, because that's the start of the, the thing uh, in, in Borneo. The, Borneo is particularly rich. It's got a thing called a kubong, which is a, a mammal, which is about the size of a cat. With a, and if you imagine a cat with a blanket over, a furry blanket over it, <laughs> that's it. And, and then, <laughs> then there are flying reptiles, like flying lizards, and there's flying snakes, and there are flying frogs, all of which glide. That's the start of the second program. I shouldn't be telling you this. It's <laughs> will, it, will it involve you going up trees? Uh, uh, me? You, personally, yes. It, can, it could be fixed. I don't want to do this you are old Father William thing, but <laughs> um, on no. the other hand, you can still well, go up trees. Oh, yeah. Getting up trees these days is quite, um, quite simple. You get somebody else to go up first. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then they haul you up. So when might we see this flight series? Hmm? When might we see it? Is it a couple of years? Uh, uh, it'll, be a, it'll be a 12-month a, a job, yeah. Not for me. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I've written the scripts. I wrote the scripts this weekend, as a matter of fact. Just finished it, posted off the second one. And, and, uh, but so uh, lots of these splendid cameramen who, as you so rightly say, make these films, not me, they do. They are at this moment saying, and how on earth does he think we're going to get that? <laughs> to which my reply is, that's your job, mate. It's just a matter of sitting up a tree for a month or two, isn't it? <laughs> yes, I think we ought, uh, shall we, shall we just, before we end and they give you a great round of applause, can we just have a round of applause for the cameraman? Because yeah, I think yeah. they are. Oh, Waiting for the rat cam, though. <laughs> I still think crocodiles and alligators are, are worse. So, David Attenborough, thank you very much. <laughs>